Hello once again, everyone. Sorry for the delay in videos. I didn't put anything out last week. I was in the process of moving, as well as in the process for registering for WW, which both Jake and I are going to be going for. So maybe I'll give you guys some content for that in September. But either way, point is, I was stressed. I apologize. Here's some fun, stabby stuff to make up for it. So because it's been March, there is, of course, the Ike's March tradition that we do here. But rather than just going over dagger techniques by themselves, for my Messer class at least, there is a decent subset of Dagger v. Messer. And both in regards to it being used by itself against the Messer slash Dussac and it being used in conjunction. So it's going to be a two-part series. We're going to start off with the Dagger v. Messer alone, and then we'll talk about my thoughts on the combination of the two weapons. But for now, at least, let's start off with our source. So our first bit of plays, our first two plays, are going to come to us uh, from the Nuremberg group, the kind of vague overall Codex Wallerstein. Um, though it is just kind of that Nuremberg fencing tradition. The Dagger V Messer here has not been translated by anybody. However, with my rough rudimentary understanding of German and kind of seeing how the action flows, I believe I have an interpretation I'm pretty happy with. Um, it's relatively straightforward, and it's just going to use the same kind of catch that we already know how to do. That being, if I have to catch with the dagger, I'm going to throw my right leg forward as I brace upon my forearm to reinforce and catch, preferably his tip will then go up, so the closer to him I get, the better, and I will transition into a grappling action by taking one of these windows. So, for our first action, is going to be a bit of a strange lockup, but when you go through it, it makes a little bit more sense. Let's go ahead and switch sides with this one. So, when he's going to strike long toward my head, because, you know, as far as he knows, I either he doesn't either see my dagger or he's not worried about it, he's just going to chop me through the head with a passing step, and I'm going to die, right? That's... As far as he's concerned, that's how this play ends. So, as he's bringing that down, I'm going to throw myself forward to get that catch so that I can then bring my left hand up. Now, my first target is I'm going to go to the outside of his arm. My goal here is I'm going to come up and I'm going to grab hold of, if they have a sleeve, this is a great time to get a solid grip. If they don't have a sleeve, you want to be grabbing onto the back of that tricep or even cinching um, kind of this pinch grip with your thumb and your uh, ring finger on either side of that elbow. Basically, this is just to make it so he can't pull away from me without me coming with him. From there, I'm gonna push my dagger forward and down around his arm. Now, my goal here is that I want my pommel to come up between the arms as I step forward. So I want this to end up here. So I'm not wrapping his wrist or even really wrapping his elbow yet. I'm focusing on getting my hand and my dagger. The image is really high up here. That will depend upon size and uh, violence, really. Certainly right now with his tip up, I can't get quite deep. If he turns his tip down, I can get a little bit deeper just because of how the arm turns, but it doesn't really matter. Point is, though, once I got these two points of contact, I'm going to use this shape, this pommel above his elbow, to torque against his arm. So his hand is pinned underneath my armpit. My fist is on the back of his elbow, so when I turn, as long as I keep that, it's going to put pressure on his elbow and make him start to step. Now to follow up with that, I keep this grip, though I can certainly transition into more things. We'll talk about possibilities there. I'm going to keep this shape, and as I start to twist, I'm going to take my left foot, and I'm going to put it in front of him toward his back foot. So the image kind of makes it look like you're throwing him this way. I believe this is meant to throw him onto his face instead. So I'm going to start that pressure, step in, and that will cause his shoulder to go forward, and thus him to go down. Now I'll show that from the other side, and we'll start talking options. So let's get there once again. Lock, grab, push in, up. So I got that nice tight lock. And you could also explode immediately into the entry. I'm choosing to step forward so I'm stable as I explain it. You can do it in a couple of different ways. But I'm going to, as I push this over, I'm taking my left hand, and I'm not necessarily rolling his shoulder forward. I'm just kind of keeping what I've got, almost like I'm trying to disconnect his arm from his shoulder as I step over, which causes him to go forward. I want all of this stuff to whip forward off of that lever I just created. And there is a bit of pain compliance here. Not a ton, not at this speed, but certainly if you cared a little bit less, and certainly if we were equal, more equal in weight class, I could probably get some pretty good torque going on here. But let's also talk options about other things you can do with your left arm. So with this kind of throw, this is essentially the same as a dagger defense where we rolled their dagger point down, if you remember that uh, particular action. Other things I can do is if I don't want to keep this grip, even though it is a very good grip, 
I could also reinforce by moving my hand to my dagger. That would give me a lot more pressure onto his arm. Won't get as much of a throw, but we'll probably get a lot more arm break. Alternatively, another thing you can do is you can throw your arm over behind his head. That's okay. We'll probably bring his head closer to the ground sooner, but not necessarily great because he'll resist that second point. Another option is if I'm just worried about the messer and less worried about breaking his arm, is as I go to step over, I'm going to throw my arm across. Be careful not to stab yourself as you do this. Here. So now I'm more focused on getting his messer away from him. We'll stand up and rotate a little bit. I'm more focused on looking at that. If I drop to the ground, he will go down, but the idea is all of this action is going that way to try and clear this away from him. These are all just options that you could do if you didn't want to use the throw or couldn't use the throw. Any, anytime you do a little bit of grappling, you should always explore these, but overall the entire action is relatively straightforward, even if it looks strange. That being, he's going to cut, so he's catch, grab so he can't leave, entwine, get that tommel up. I really can't emphasize that enough. Get that pommel up above his arm. If it's still below, he can bend it, he can do other things. Not to mention if it's still below, you may accidentally run into it yourself. If it's up here, it's right in front of my belly button. As long as I keep my core strong, he can't do anything against it, I can't uh, really stab myself. So you start that twist, step in front, over he will go. So, relatively straightforward, nothing too complicated. Let's talk about the second play. The second play is gonna be almost kind of anticlimactic in comparison. So for this one, I'm once again going to catch in the same way, but I'm going to exploit the other door he leaves me. So he cuts down and I catch. Rather than reaching to the outside, I'm now going to reach to the inside. Now there's a couple different points we can go for. This is just gonna be your standard Messer style single arm wrap, right? Or ligadura if you're from the Italian tradition. The idea here though is it's depending upon where I want to immobilize him. I have the shorter weapon. Getting close to him is a good fight for me, but an important thing that must be taken into consideration, even though I got the shorter weapon, Jake still has a hand free, he's bigger than me. I may not want to get all the way to the body. So while a lot of the time you will see this arm wrap, if he stops that, nothing now matters weapon-wise. We're body to body, we're fighting. So it may be in my best interest, even though I'm just gonna wrap and stab, to focus on his weapon instead so he's more inclined to either let go of it, which is a win for me, or he'll have to reach further to get me. And I may be able to strip the weapon and walk away. So let's go over that. He starts his cut, I block. I'm gonna reach up, and rather than going deep for his arm, I'm gonna go kind of parallel to his hand. And the goal here is that as I bring my left foot forward, over, down, and then I wanna bring the back of my hand up against his pommel to start rolling his arm to the outside. This makes it very easy to break his grip. Even if they're really neat fisting it, it's turning his arm over. From here, I have something very apparent. He's not worried about that anymore. I can just launch my stab or he'll leave and I now have the messer securely in my hand. This also has a sort of almost flow to it, which is quite nice. I do this with the cut all the time wherein I will cover and my wrap will become part of powering my cut because my arm is going back and this arm is going forward. This same thing can apply with the dagger. Whether or not I hit him, it still works out quite well, so I'll show that here. He throws his cut. It's all just kind of uh, synonymous, right? It's all synced up, and I really like the way that particularly ends up, etc. And he's more likely to bring his left hand up to defend than try to fight me since I've got that locked up so much. But either way, a pretty straightforward play. We'll show it from the other side once, and then we'll move on to a little bit later period. So. Here we go, lock, wrap next to the hand with the left step, there's your dagger, there's my master. Nice and fun. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move ahead in period, and the other main messer versus dagger source we're going to get is technically not messer versus dagger. So the next one that we're going to go over is Paul's Hector Meyer, uh, specifically in his mixed weapons one section, because he has two. Um, in his first mixed weapon section, we see the dagger used against the Dusak. So if you've seen my video on sword versus dagger, we did some of the plays from there. Now what's nice about these two plays is that one, they do show a little bit of back and forth, which is always nice to see whether or not that was intended or if it's being shown more as example, we don't know. Uh, Mayor tends to do that. But what I like about these two plays is they kind of circumnavigate what we just went over. So if you remember 
our dagger versus sword from both Fiore and uh, Mare. It was always kind of, hey, you block here and you move around, right? This is my strongest block with the dagger. It's not the only block I can do, as we'll see, but this or some form of this is what I want to have happen because it negates where his weapon is by it being up on the high line and I can do kind of whatever I want. So we're going to kind of, in my, in my theory, right, tinfoil hats on, two ways of getting around that. And again, Mayor is using a Dussac, but it's really just a cut and thrust sword of the time. It really could be anything. So for this, a good way of getting around it, in my opinion, and what Mayor is kind of having us do here as the Messer player, is you're going to advance your right foot forward, but rather than cutting with it, you're using that to set up a second shot within distance, right? Now the idea here is a strange one, because we don't normally talk about stepping, then cutting. Because normally it's not a very good idea, and if I had an equal length weapon, if he steps forward, boom, that's my tempo to go get him. But since I have a smaller weapon, yes, I could try and crowd in, but there's a lot of stuff I'm running, right? I'm probably going to get significantly cut on my way in, and he may cover himself at the same time. So it is somewhat safer for him to not quite body faint, as it were, but enter into a tighter distance because he knows I have to wait for him, right? Now this first way, he's going to cut up from below off of that solid leg to go up into my torso. The reason that this is particularly good is if I found myself blocking already, I've just made a huge opening for him to take. That's my hypothesis. Mayor doesn't describe where you are, he just describes your right foot forward as well. So, in this case, for sake of ease, I'm going to go ahead and be in this guard as I can move very easily into one of the two blocks that I will be about to do. So as he's bringing that message forward, I'm going to bring it out to cover myself. Now this is going to look like a weak parry. It's surprisingly not. The thing about this, and it doesn't actually matter what kind of dagger you use either, it's going to catch my blade and slide up into that disc guard, and it's really more like I'm catching it with my hand. Don't think of this as trying to catch it with the blade and create angle. It's gonna slide up to that disc, and you just hold it in place. So, kind of gear shifting almost. If you remember when we defended against the thrust, it's that same parry, right? He starts cutting, just out to block. Now, at the same time, and certainly for practicing, you'll want to do this in bits, but at the same time, the second I have that arm going out there, I'm also going to be moving away from this cut to keep myself safe. I'm going to be stepping up and out to the side, grabbing hold of his wrist with my left hand from above, because I want to suppress that down, and then I can launch my stab, either with a step or without a step. Anything will work. I could also attack other openings if need be. But overall, it's pretty much what you would expect. It really feels almost more like you're dealing with a thrust than a cut. So I'll show that a little more synonymously. That's kind of our action here. Pretty straightforward, nothing really to write home about. I'll only show it on one side because that's where all the cool stuff happens. So let's talk about his response. Now, much like when we did the dagger versus the sword, his first priority is to get my dagger offline again. Now what Mayer describes here is the dagger is going to come in, you're going to block it with your left hand and shove it away to your left side. As we talked about with the sword v dagger, Basically, the idea is he's buying time between my secondary attack so we can free his arm up again. So we find ourselves there, right? He goes ahead and attacks. I get my block and I'm coming in. He wants to paw this and just create distance. Because even if I stop solidly, I'm going to have to pull back to look for my next target. And that's his window. He does not want to grab me here, though. If he entwines his hand around mine, I have the better weapon for this fight. He does not. So it's in his best interest to just block. Now his next action is to step away and cut to whatever opening is nearest. My interpretation for this is he's going to bring his pommel downward and relatively tight to his body as he steps back to just nick me, right? Anything will work. It's not pleasant. I don't like seeing that sword move there, right? You're just going to cut whatever you can get. But in regards to breaking his grip, uh, let's go ahead and switch sides and stand up close to the camera here. And we'll be super disjointed for this. Let's go ahead and uh, hold your arm up. All he's doing is as he brings that pommel down and steps backward, I can't hold on to him and not get hit with the sword. Super slow, because I'm going to go with you. It's going to hit me. I can't do anything about it with all that going backward. The trick is, to make this successful, he needs to think of it less as a cut and much more as he's just going back into ever. When he does that, the tip will pretty much always end up having some momentum, and his arm will stay glued to his hip. If he thinks about this more as a cut, then this sort of thing happens and I can follow him, if that makes sense. So, 
we end up with a relatively simple play of I block, I step in, try to stab, he paws me off and escapes. And either I stay on him or I let him go. There's really not much more to say about it. So one more time to completion, right? Whoa, right? And that's good for me. As far as I'm concerned, I've now created a lot of distance. Bye, right? He was attacking me first anyway. But a pretty good play, pretty simple, easily done, makes a lot of sense. I don't know if the mayor is meaning this opening in particular. He could also cut at my legs. He could flick this up toward my face. It varies. I just find that that particular cut is very good and very simple to do. Now, let's talk about our second play. This is another one that gets around this guard, this time specifically, and this one's fun. Let's uh, switch sides to this. So, the idea here is going to be Jake is going to already start with his messer up above his head. He's going to step forward, but not cut. I'm going to see that, and as I should, I'm going to bring my arm up, which is going to lead to him grabbing what I just put forward. So let's break that down again. We know that when that foot comes forward with that sword high, I need to be ready to catch it. I cannot delay. If this sword gets even to here, this is no longer a good block for me. It's going to suck and I'll be too far away to do anything. So I have to go on that time. Jake knows that I'm gonna make that shape because I can make no other. As such, the second he sees my messer, sorry, not my messer, my dagger and my arm connected, he's just going to step forward with his left foot and grab hold of that shape. Now, the immediate thing you may be thinking is, okay, well, what about the edge or things along those lines? Not really a big concern for him. Because I've got this pin so tightly to my arm, I really can't get any leverage to cut. He's grabbing it the same way that we grab a sword in the half-sword grip. Sure, he might get a little bit cut, but I'll be dead long before that. So really, make them make this you know, burrito shape and then grab it. It's pretty straightforward. So let's look at that again. So, he faints. Ah, uh, uh-oh, right? Opens me up, cuts me wherever he will. Now, really important thing when it comes to grabbing is I need my dagger tight to my forearm. Otherwise, when he cuts, that's going to rebound and really hurt me. If you see that their dagger is not, because they very well may step up and try to do something else, you're still wanting to focus on grabbing the dagger for this, right? Get his wrist, get his fingers, etc. Don't grab his wrist. Because if you do that, I can get this working for me again. You want to suppress where they're connecting, the same way that I grab hold of a strong of a sword, as opposed to out here, right? Or here. So. I'm in a pretty bad position here. He's duped me pretty big, and here comes this messer. The good news is, his messer didn't really change position at all. I still know where it is, and there's still only one place he wants to cut me, that being down this way. So I'm gonna kinda take a page out of his book. As this messer's coming down, I'm going to focus on defending myself again with a sort of pawing motion. But rather than pawing to get away, I'm gonna paw to get in. So a lot of things gotta happen simultaneously here, so let's go over them slowly. He starts his cut, I take the bait and step forward, he grabs me. So the first thing I need to do is I need to counter this opening motion as I deal with the block. Now, moving two arms independently is hard, right? I can't do two things at once. So what I'm going to make sure I do is as I throw my left arm out to block this, I'm going to throw my right arm forward to quote exactly, put your dagger in front of your head, right? Uh, drop this arm a little bit. I interpret this in the way I make it work for me is when I bring my elbow forward, my elbow tip specifically, like I'm throwing an elbow at his face, my dagger's still married to that. That's a lot of leverage against one arm. At the very least, it gets it forward, makes it hard for him to control where that is. Plus, combined with me pushing my arm out, that's a big motion, a big turn of my core, not too hard to do. Now, following this, I've pawed it off, I've got myself some strength. What I'm going to do is I want to go ahead and keep my arm here. If I haven't grabbed it already, I want to try and grab it or I'll just get to hold it. I'm going to throw my left leg forward and keep my dagger against my chest to drive that into his face. If he falls back like he is right now, I'm going to go ahead and call it good and just return to good stance, not leap. So let's talk about that last bit a little bit. Mayer's description for the end of it is you push it forward with your left step, then draw back into good stance. I interpret this not as he ran away from me, let's go back to distance, though certainly if I wanted to run away, that's an option. I interpret this more as I've gotten hold of his sword. That's what I wanted out of all of this. I've gotten him scared, 
So I pull this back, and now we're in the game of, oh, oh where am I going to stab, right? He's on the back foot now. And at any time, if I decide I don't want to go for his body, I can just hurt his arm. I can grab his messer. I can do a bunch of just frankly mean things to get him not hitting me with the sword. That just turns into a murder. It's a murder while he's holding a messer. So let's go over that again in finer detail. Then we'll show it a little more fluidly. Then we'll, uh, we'll switch sides. So he cuts down. I take the bait. He grabs me. Swing over with both. Right? Don't lose your footing. Grab hold of this because you're going to need it. And another thing you can do is if you need it, brace your pommel of your dagger onto your chest. This can help a lot, even if you were in partial armor. Same idea, right? And just throw your left leg straight in, and that dagger is going to get in there, right? From there, still got my shape. Draw it back. Stab him again. So let's go ahead and switch sides. We'll show it again. Pretty straightforward. And I was kind of surprised when I was first thinking, I was like, okay, am I supposed to do this? It doesn't seem like that stab should land. I mean, there's a lot of limbs in between, but you're just throwing yourself forward with a dagger vaguely at his face, right? That's not that hard to just get him to react, and that's all I need. Because the second I have that, as long as I've got control, I can leave this. I can do little cuts. I can do other things that will make the fight in my favor, right? At that point, it becomes... Whatever. I got a dagger, you don't. So relatively interesting play from the perspective of one, cool finish, really cool finish, and also both plays involve him circumnavigating the common block, which, at least in regards to chrono uh, chronological writing, this is the not the latest period, but later down the line. So it can be presumed everyone knows this block if you're using a dagger versus any sort of sword. You have to, or you die. So... There's two ways to get around it in a very clever way. At least that's how I read it, that's how it flows to me, and I think that makes a decent amount of sense. But either way, most important thing to remember when you have a dagger versus any sword, you're in the knock, make the use of fighting at your ideal range, and don't get cut. <laughs> if you're the one using the sword, don't get stabbed. <laughs> Be clever, cut to their openings. But either way, once again, sorry for the delay, but hopefully this makes up for it. We'll have more content with Dagger and Messer coming, because we're gonna talk about Albrecht Durer's sketches and my thoughts on that, so please stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching. We'll go over some other techniques another time.